So, um, so let's dive into the word this morning. We're in a series um, called I Believe, where we are looking at um, the Apostles' Creed and um, studying the creed and saying what these theological statements are and understanding how they apply to our lives, what they mean, and what difference it makes in our lives. And so last week we gave you the introduction on the statement I believe. The statement I believe is one of the deepest statements that we can make. It's not a a statement of, man, this is what I think. This is a conviction that I believe in. And so this creed has been um, passed down for thousands of years through the church, and it is at the core, the minimum of what we believe as followers of Jesus. And so over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be studying a lot of theology, but we're going to hopefully see how this theology applies to our daily lives and how it makes a difference in how we live. And so this week, we're going to be looking at the topic, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 17, and I'm going to read from 22 down to 31, Acts 22, uh, Acts 17, 22 to 31. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to the unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the heaven and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. For one man... From one man, he has made every nationality live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day where he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Last week when we began this series, I was in... Timothy in 2 Timothy, and we talked about how Paul encouraged Timothy to live a life in such a way that his witness of the gospel was not hindered, but he also encouraged him to be grounded in his faith so that he wouldn't be blown away by every teaching that was out there. There is never a greater truth that's more applicable today than those two truths, that our lives, we live our lives in such a way that people see Jesus in us, that our witness is not destroyed but that we are grounded in what we believe so we don't shift back and forth in different ideas and different thinkings that will lead us astray away from Jesus. But in his second letter to Timothy, Paul tells him one thing in 2 Timothy 1. He says, hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me. In the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And that's our goal in this series, to encourage us in the teachings of the church that have been passed down for hundreds and thousands of years and to guard the good deposit given to us by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We aren't approaching this series to argue whether these statements are true or not. We're coming from the belief that the Bible is true, that the Bible is inerrant. We believe that the Bible is authoritative and without error. It is perfectly trustworthy because we have a trustworthy God. This is not an apologetic series, and, we're, and these are not beliefs that we believe are secondary importance. These are things that at the core are what makes us followers of Jesus. Everybody believes something. Faith is crucial to human existence. We believe that we can know what time it is. Some of you got here early this morning because you didn't know what time it was. We believe that if we drop an object, that gravity will force it to the ground. We believe that day follows night and there's a predictable symmetry of how nature functions. We begin early in life by trial and error to identify persons whom we can trust. It doesn't take long to figure out whether mom and dad are reliable. 
every child, if honest, can do a pretty accurate assessment of those areas in which their parents are reliable and those areas in which they must learn to fend for themselves. And the older we get, the more sophisticated we become in assessing what persons and institutions which we put our faith in. Faith, based on some rational process, is involved in items as varied in our confidence in what toothpaste we buy, what news reports we listen to, what airline we choose to fly, and the person that we choose to commit ourselves to marriage. And the Apostles' Creed is an endeavor to reduce to a very basic creedal statement what I believe and what I don't believe about God. It is highly individualistic in that it, when I say it or choose not to say it or choose to say parts of it, even then I'm making a faith statement. And the Apostles' Creed is a succinct statement of what we believe and what we don't believe about God. It is a corporate statement. It didn't come together through haphazard fashion. It is a combined effort of is centuries as of believers to date this morning as it was 2,000 more simple years ago. And, more complex, and at the same time, it brings all of the ideas, historical the richness of faith content the of those millions of followers of Jesus of the past so when we centuries. recite the creed, we're not declaring that I that just declare my beliefs, church of God, but I join with a great company that what of believers was true in this back common then expression. Is still true today. The statement, like I said last week, we recognize that as up to date this morning as it was 2,000 years ago. For this and faith. at the same time, it brings all of this. And so our faith is not evolving and saying we've got to make it continue. Of followers of Jesus of the past twenty centuries. women were willing to give their lives not for that. I just declare my beliefs. The faith that has been passed down from one generation to the next generation and it is our responsibility. But as we learn this, we pass like said, it last week, we to the next generation. We don't take that for granted. Men and women have died. So this week, we're going to focus on the first section. Faith. It reads like this: I believe. And so our faith is not in God. Evolving and saying we've the got Father to Almighty, sexual, no. Creator of heaven and earth. Men and women were willing Here are to three big characteristics them. about God. This is a faith that has been he is Father, one generation, he's Almighty, the generation, and it is our he's Creator. But as we learn God is we it immensely powerful. We don't take that for granted. And so this week we're God going to focus on the first section. Intimately. It reads like this, personal. I believe in God. He's immensely Father Almighty, powerful, Creator of heaven and earth. Here are three big characteristics about personal. God. Catch him? God is he Almighty. Is the creator of everything. He's, he's also Father. God is, God is immensely powerful, powerful, intimately personal. God is the passage we read in Acts perfectly personal. captures these themes of God as he's Father, as Almighty, as Creator. Powerful. It's a speech that Paul was giving to some very important people in the city personal. of Athens. He's on God his almighty big missionary journey and through what everything. we would call Syria and he's Turkey and Greece. Father. God is immensely powerful intimately personal. The passage we read in Acts perfectly captures these themes of God as Father, as Almighty, as Creator. It's a speech that Paul was giving to some very important people in the city of Athens. He's on his second big missionary journey and through what we would call Syria and Turkey and Greece. And he stops in Athens. And he spends time there in Jewish synagogues and the Greek marketplace. And then he was invited to this meeting in the Arapagus where um, they held courts and city council meetings. And there he directly challenges the belief systems with some bold statements about the nature of God. Look at me again at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gave everyone life and breath and all things from one man, he has made every nationality live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Paul begins with this strong emphasis as God is creator and almighty, and he makes five statements about God's almightiness. One, God is the world. God made the world and everything in it. Two, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. That means he's the ruler. Three, he gives everyone life and breath and everything. Number four, he made the nations. Number five, he marked out time and laid boundaries. Think about that for a second. God marked out all the dates and all the land for all the nations for all time. Mesopotamians will start here. They'll end here. England will start here. They'll end here. America will start here. They'll end whenever God determines it will end. Why would God do that? Paul answers the question next in verse 27. He did this that they might seek God. 
And perhaps they might reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. Pause there for a second. Would you let that sink in? God did all of this so that you would look to him, so that you would reach out to him, so that you would find him. And then he makes the most amazing statement there. He is not far from any of us. Some of you need to hear that this morning. God is not far from you. Despite your sin, despite your failures, despite your pain, despite your mistakes, despite your hard works or no works, despite your success or your failure, none of that changes the fact that God is not far from you. You might not feel it, but don't judge your faith based on your feelings. Judge your faith based on what Scripture says, because he says he will never leave you or forsake you. Either your feelings are right or God is right. You've got to choose. He's not far from you. God is intimately personal. And then Paul continues with two examples of how intimately personal this God is. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So Paul begins to quote two Greek philosophers who happen to match biblical teaching there. First, he says that everything that is found in us is found in God. And second, that we are his offspring. We are his children. Remember, God is intimately personal. Then he concludes with the application, the so what. He starts with the word, therefore. And you'll hear preachers say this all the time. When you ever see the word therefore, you'll need to find out what it's there for, right? And here, it's to help people transition from theology to daily living. Verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like silver or gold or stone, an image fashioned by human art or imagination. Verse 30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. What is this there for? So that we would repent. Repent of what? To turn away from our sin. We need to repent of what? Bad theology. What bad theology? Bad theology of not believing that God is immensely powerful. Bad theology of not believing that God is intimately personal. Bad theology of not believing that God is our Father, that God is Almighty, that God is our Creator. Why do we need to repent? Verse 31, because he set a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man that he has appointed. He has provided proof for this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And in case you didn't catch that, um, that's Jesus. And we're going to talk about him in a few weeks. But if Paul is commanding us to repent of our bad theology, how do we know we have bad theology? It comes out in two ways. Number one, it's the obvious, our beliefs. The second way is subtle our daily lives, how we live. Let's look at both of these statements. I'm going to combine Father Almighty together, but let's look at these statements a little bit more deeper. Number one, Father Almighty. Father Almighty Creator. Interestingly, the first two are put together in the creed. He mentions God as creator, but Almighty Father. Think about it this way. He is Almighty. He can do anything He wants. But He's Father. He'll do what is necessary for our well-being. He's almighty. He can. He's father. He will. To call him father almighty means that we can trust him in every circumstance because he will do whatever needs to be done to take care of you and I. Romans 8 says it, expresses this truth beautifully where in verse 31 it says, what are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also grant us everything? What is the limit of everything there in verse 32? There is no limit. Whatever we truly need, our Father will make sure we have because he is Father Almighty. His scripture calls him in the Old Testament, El Shaddai, Almighty God. This week I read... Isaiah 40, in preparing for this sermon and marveled at the wonderful promise that comes at the end of this chapter. 
As I read this passage, would you just notice the promise of strength for the weary is based solely not on what we do. It's on who God is. Listen to this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There's no limit in his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youth may become faint and weary, and young men may stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. I love the two questions at the beginning. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Isaiah is asking, don't you know your God? Don't you know who he is? He is Father Almighty. That's the God I believe in. And because I know my God, I know that when I'm tired, he will give me strength to run. When you know that God is Father Almighty, you have strength and courage to face even the worst that life can throw at you. There's another way you could put it. Father means that he's a God who cares for me. Almighty means that he can do whatever needs to be done for me. Fill in the blanks with this sentence. If I truly believe that God was Father Almighty, I would blank. How would you fill in that blank? I kind of think I know my answer. I think I would trust him more. I think I would complain less. I think I would smile more and frown less. I think I would try to stop playing God and let God be God in my life. I think I'd be quicker to forgive, slower to get angry. I think I would risk more because I'm secure in his love, that my love is not, my, the grace that God gives me is not based on my performance. I think it would mean that I would say openly, God, your will be done. And I would mean it because I know that God is not my enemy. I think I would pray more, complain less. I think I would enjoy what I have more, knowing that if I needed something else, that God would give it to me. How would you fill in that blank? If I truly believed that God was Father Almighty, I would blank. How would you fill that blank? He is Father Almighty. Number two, he is the creator of heaven and earth. The creeds make the statement that God is our creator. What does that mean for us? I think it means two things. Number one, our worldview rests upon the truth that God created all things. The biblical writers repeatedly ascribed all of creation to the works of God. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews 11, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Genesis 1 tells us the importance of how God created Repeatedly, the text says, and God said, first there was God's creative words. He spoke, light appeared. Then he spoke, waters were separated. There was dry ground, then vegetation, then the sun, the moon, the stars were formed. Then came fish and birds and land animals. And finally, Adam and Eve. Eight times the phrase is repeated in Genesis 1. God said, he spoke, and light shined through the darkness. He spoke, and the waters receded around the earth. He spoke, and dry land appeared. He spoke, vegetation appeared. He spoke, the sun filled the sky, and the moon filled the darkness, and millions of stars twinkled in the night. He spoke, and the sea teemed with fish, and birds began to fly in the air. He spoke, and the cattle grazed, and the squirrels chased after nuts, and the otters flock, uh, frolicked in the streams, and the kangaroo began hopping in, um, on the outback. And finally, he spoke and created Adam, and he breathed into him the breath of life, and Adam became became a living soul. And when Adam became lonely, God took a rib from his side and created Eve, and human life began. All of this was created by God. Now, I know there's a lot of arguments on whether the earth was created in six literal days, or none of that matters. At the end of the day, do you believe that you were created by God? Are you a created are you created in the image of God or are you a product of chance? The second application 
of knowing that God is our creator is you will properly understand the universe. You will never properly understand the universe until you know that God, he created it. If you leave God out, you've missed the fundamental truth about the universe. That means that in order to understand human origins and to understand the true history of the universe, you don't begin with vain speculations of science, but with God's understanding as it's revealed to us in his word. Start there, and you start on firm ground. Start anywhere else, and you sink into the quicksand of humanistic unbelief. You have to start with God. This is why the creeds begin, I believe, in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. When we put God at the center of all things, then everything else finds its proper place. Proverbs says it this way, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge of the Holy One is insight. No one can understand and know the universe and answers to the great questions of life without also knowing God. There are three questions of life, right? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? That first question is the most fundamental. Until you answer that, you cannot answer the other two properly. If you think that you're the product of chance or you're a product of evolution and there was no creator involved in the forming of your life, if that is what you truly believe, then you don't know where you came from, you don't know why you're here, you don't know where you're going. You know, when God put the world together, he put me in it. Just the way I am, just where I am, just who I am. He fashioned my arms, he molded my bones, he knitted me in my mother's womb. He made me nearsighted where I need glasses. He made me right-handed. He made me of an Indian descent. He gave me brown eyes and black hair and a big nose. He put inside me a passionate love for steak bubble tea, and coffee, lots and lots of coffee. He called me to preach. He gave me a love for reading, gave me a heart to see people thrive in their calling and blessed me beyond words with an amazing wife and three wonderful children, the second of whom became a teenager today. He also didn't give me the ability to dance well. And I'm definitely not much of a singer. That's why they always turn me off. In short, God made me just the way I am. I am a designer original, one of a kind, limited edition of one, unique as any snowflake that ever fell on this earth. God made me just the way I am with all of my quirks. And yes, there are many quirks. And friends, God made you just the way you are. You are a designer original a limited edition of one. What we say about other, others is also true of us. When God made you, he broke the mold. He made you with all of your quirks, every single one of them. And can I say this? Because God made you, you matter. Because God made you, you have value. Because God made you, you have worth. And because God made you, you fit in. You belong here. Think about it this way. You're here because God wanted you here. It doesn't matter if you were a surprise to your parents. It doesn't matter if you knew your parents or not. You were not a surprise to God. You were made in the image of God. You were created by God. You belong to God. He has made you the way you are, and you couldn't escape him even if you tried, and you would not be happy until you know him intimately because he has put a God-shaped vacuum in your heart that only he and he alone can fill. He made you. He loves you in spite of your sin, and he sent his son to die on the cross, be buried and raised from the dead so that you could be a party of the family of God. Your creator has become your savior. Friends, that's how much God loves you. Everything starts with the God who created us. Start anywhere else and you will be perpetually confused. You'll never know who you are until you know who God is. This is why the creeds say, God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, your maker. Let me ask these three questions as I close. Do you believe that God is your Father? Do you see him as close or do you see him far away? 
Is he involved in your life? Or is he detached? If God is distant or detached from you, maybe you might not see him as father. You might not think of him as father. Can I remind you that scripturally, the scripture consistently describes God as intimate. He is not far from many of us. What about the next one? Do you believe that God is almighty? Now, this one seems easy enough. I don't think you're going to find many Christians that believe in a small God with weak powers. You're not going to find many that believe in a limited power God. Most of us would say we believe that God is almighty. But do you live like you believe that God is almighty? Do you worry a lot? Are you constantly fearful? It probably means that you don't fully trust God because you don't really believe that he's almighty, all-powerful. How do you react when things go bad? You get controlling, angry, judgmental. All of that emanates from this one belief that God isn't powerful enough to handle my problems, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Is that you? When you need help or advice, where do you go to? Do you ask all your friends or post on Facebook or Google the answer? If you go to anyone else before God, can I challenge you that you don't see him as almighty? Lastly, do you believe that God is your creator? Do you believe that you have been created by him? That he's the one who shaped you and formed you? That he loves you, that he has a purpose for you, that you are not here by accident. You're not simply a product of chance and circumstance, that you have been placed here by God. Does that give you purpose in life? Does that give you motivation to live your life for Jesus? See, one of the consequences of really believing that God is creator is a sense of accountability to God, of saying, God, my life is not mine, it's yours how do I live my life for your glory? We're not the masters of our own destiny, proper, contrary to popular culture. We're not free to do what we feel is best. Our lives belong to Jesus. He dictates to us how we live and what we do. So can I ask this morning, what do you need to repent of? Where's God tugging at your heart? What part of God are you missing out? God is loving Father, near to you, intimate, personal, God is almighty Lord, immensely powerful, able to change any circumstance, situation in your life. God is creator, deserving of worship, the one to whom we are accountable. Listen to these words as we close. When the reformer Martin Luther was asked, what does it mean to say that God is father, almighty creator of heaven and earth? Here's how he responded. Just listen. This is what he said. He said, I believe that God created me, along with all creatures. God gave to me body and soul, eyes, ears, and all the other parts of my body, my mind, and all my senses, and preserves them as well. God gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and land, spouse and children, fields, animals, and all that I own. Every day, God abundantly provides everything I need to nourish this body and life. God protects me against all danger, shields and defends me against all evil. God does this because of his pure, fatherly, and divine goodness and mercy. Not because I earned it, not because I deserve it. For all of this, I must thank, praise, serve and obey God. Yes. You believe in God as Father Almighty, creator of your life. If that is true, then you must thank, praise, serve, and obey God. That's the only response we can have saying, this is not my life, it's your life, be glorified in your name. As we come to communion this morning, can I invite you to examine 
your heart, and you see God as your Father, and you see him loving you, caring for you, there for you, intimately personal with you, and you see him as almighty, able to move mountains for you if he needs to, and you see him the one who formed you and shaped you and made you of your life. If you haven't, spend some time with Jesus. Repent of those things that you need to repent of and see Jesus as bigger and greater than you can ever imagine and worship him with all that. Would you then thank, praise, serve, and obey this God? We come to communion this morning. The way that we do communion here, we invite you to spend some time meditating on God's word, allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table. If you've got offering, you could drop it in the offering baskets as well. If you're new, you could drop the new cards in there as well. Um, but would you spend some time with Jesus? Reflect on his truth. Reflect on his word. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you? And then whenever you're ready, would you come, grab the elements, and let's worship Jesus together as we partake of communion.